Johnny has a few finer details. We're here this morning with Rosemary Watkins, who is a psychotherapist, and she's going to be answering a couple of queries that um, we get throughout our day-to-day -day, um, with clients in organising and decluttering. So um, thank you for your time this morning, Rosemary. You're very welcome, Helen. One of the questions um, that we often come across is, what's the difference between a hoarder and someone who has clutter? Yeah, so a very important question, actually, because um, oftentimes those uh, terms are used interchangeably, uh, but there is quite a distinction. Many people would fall into the category of clutter and having clutter in their home, and often it's to do with the busyness of life and time poor in uh, attending to them, and also um, that the impact on families, obviously, and couples can be quite significant. But hoarding is quite a distinct and separate um, it's actually an illness and is, it can even fit into that obsessive compulsive disorder illness. Um, there's some uh, new um, definition now of it in the DSM-5 and I might get a copy of that to you for your information at some point. That would be great. Thank you. Um, and advice for people who want to help a loved one um, who has clutter, what would you say on that? Yes, I think the impact, for, as I said, on the couple or a family can be quite significant when someone is cluttering. Like, to one, it's uh, something that's you know really important and can't be touched, and to another, it's just a pile of rubbish. And, uh, and then lots of places in the home can become magnets for that clutter. Like, kids can come home and drop the bags in the, the hallway, um, playrooms, toy rooms can become uh, really disorganized bench tops and any horizontal surface pretty well can become um, pretty full with, with stuff. stuff. <laughs> and um, for, for the family members that don't like that and like to have a more organized space, it can be quite distressing. And um, it certainly can lead to conflict in, in between them. So the ones that want to help the, the family member who does clutter, um, again, keeping it distinct from a hoarding disorder, disorder because that would need a more a medical referral. Yes. And, specialist intervention and help um, but if it's uh, clutter then definitely the ways they can go about it is first not to nag for <laughs> using that <laughs> word loosely um, but to be more encouraging and supportive of them uh, where possible so things like um, inviting that person to see the impact on the fullness of the family life or the couple's life um, and the impact it's having on that person so they can speak from that perspective uh, like this is really having an impact on me and uh, what I'd like around it is and you know bringing that person on board with them uh, rather than moving into the critical way of confronting it can be very useful and um, and then if it's not changing they can put some strategies in place to assist or even small things like um, putting some boxes or places where they can put things that the person that likes cluttering knows all my papers are in there, all my receipts are in there, yep. and that person can tidy it up for themselves into that specific box. Something like that could be helpful. Is that the sort of thing you're wondering about, or is it yeah. more the emotional um, side of Well, also, so too, like if a family member um, from outside of the home wants to, mm -hmm. to help, say, um, someone that they feel doesn't have the same skill set, or um, that you know their space isn't how maybe they would have the space. Yes, <clears throat> of course, yes, and certainly very many differences exist in uh, families around aspects like that. Excuse me a moment, I just turned my throat. It's okay. <coughs> um, yes, yeah, so the family member that wants to help um, and sees it as a different uh, viewing, a, a different way, um, I guess on one level um, they might not have a great say because they're not living with the person and it's really up to someone how they live their life and what they're comfortable with. At the same time, if the person that is in that space with the clutter is willing to have some support or input, but just feeling overwhelmed, really exhausted by it, because that can often happen too, that the person um, doesn't really like it. They, they, they feel they've got to a point where they can't actually tackle it, and, uh, and that can be, uh, you know, become quite overwhelming. And they might say to family members, I'd love to get this sorted, but don't know how. And so then family members are brought into it, and ways they can support them then is to uh, talk through you know, how they'd like that, maybe looking at some professional assistance to, to help them with that process, uh, because sometimes having that person to walk the road with them as they do it and guide can be really helpful. And, um, and I certainly have used uh, 
services I've done myself in the past, particularly with my home office. It's, yeah. uh, it can be a place where uh, it's really lovely to have that person walk, you know, just walking alongside as you do it. Okay. Someone so a bit more be, impartial. Yeah, someone a bit more impartial, absolutely. Because family members can run into a bit of conflict as they and disagreements <laughs> as they as they go about trying to support each other, uh, or even well intentioned, but not uh, it might not be what the person wants to release at that point, or even if they are feeling overwhelmed. So I think um, being open, being respectful, you know, maintaining good communication, good eye messages, and then uh, being willing to maybe step back and allow the person who has the clutter to uh, seek the help. That Um, is it true the way you perceive your clutter is the way you perceive yourself and your relationships? Mm, that's a pretty big one and a deep one. Um, I guess um, certainly the you know we've come into an era and a lot of baby boomers particularly have a lot of attachment <laughs> to um, to stuff and uh, it, that comes out on the back of a lot of poverty or a lot of not having. Or needing to save for the rainy day or you don't throw away something because you might need it again. Mm -hmm. So if they come up with that attitude in their own home as children, then they'll often still hold on a lot to things today. And it's really hard. Or they've come to a place too where there's often a fear of being poor again. And so identity and attachment to, to stuff, it does reflect something of an emotional uh, burden or something going on inside it's about connection to that stuff. So the stuff isn't just about stuff, and it's not so easy to discard it because it becomes a, a part of themselves almost, and, a, and almost something that helps them feel like they've succeeded for some people, right, and yes. more stuff they have around them. And, uh, and as I said, often underneath that is that fear of going back to a time when they didn't have very much around them. And then the other side of that coin, the, we, there's children, for example, more in the consumerism sort of point of view, so they get lots of stuff, yeah. and uh, and many of them have an income uh, without an income even can have lots of stuff around them that their parents or you know would not have even dreamed of or up to twenty years of collecting the clutter. Yeah, sort of, uh, that, that aspect of it. So am I, is that yes, the sort of track you're yeah, looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So for that's that. definitely an identity uh, connection there. Mm -hmm. Yeah.